And, and good morning, happy Sabbath, everybody. Sabbath. We're delighted to have you here today and to be here worshiping with you. Could you do me a favor? As I travel, I like to take a selfie with the different churches. So I'm going to invite Jared to come on up here. We're going <laughs> to take a picture. Now, don't move. Just smile as big as you can. <laughs> if you move, it's all blurry, so you have to be still, okay? Okay, he took, he took 50 pictures. Uh, we bring you greetings from uh, North America and the World Church and, uh, and amazing facts. Uh, I haven't had a chance to tell Pastor Johnny, but we brought a few gifts for your congregation, uh, some material for you to watch and read and listen to. I don't think I have enough for everybody here. Uh, but a couple of things we brought is um, two of our latest sharing DVDs. One is called Revelation, the Bride, the Beast, and Babylon. And uh, this was, it took about uh, three years to produce this. It's a full-length documentary that talks about what the history of the church and what happened and what's coming in the last days. And this is what we're really excited about, called Kingdoms in Time. Uh, it took us three and a half years to produce this. And um, it is basically covering the evidence in the Bible that the Bible is true using prophecies, all the prophecies that point to Jesus, Daniel chapter 2, the fall of Jerusalem. There's some dramatic recreations. It's very interesting to watch, called Kingdoms in Time. It also has, it's in uh, English and Spanish and Mandarin and a number of subtitle languages here. I don't know how the pastor will choose to share these with you. Perhaps any of you that memorize Psalm 119. If you memorize Psalm 119, he'll give you one. Now you can open your Bibles, and you can, you know, here's a couple of starters for you. And keep amazing facts in your prayers, we pray. Uh, you know, we're doing everything we can, as well as we can, to reach as many as we can, as far as we can, as long as we can. And uh, if you want to know more about Amazing Facts, or want to study some of our materials, just go to amazingfacts.com or .org. You'll see what we're doing and who we are. We're all about winning souls, and we are a ministry of the people. So thank you for your support. Can I move this microphone just back somewhere? This morning, the flowers are beautiful. My wife wanted to let you know. The reason that they've been moved is because I'm allergic to flowers. <laughs> and uh, she's not. But, uh, and yesterday, uh, they were nice enough to take us to your botanical gardens. And I went through uh, an atrium filled with flowers and survived. But it was, it was, it was really very pretty. I do enjoy the smell of flowers, but sometimes my, uh, I start to sneeze. Anyway, um, in our message this morning about how to survive in the last days, I'd like to direct your attention to a story you probably all know. It's in the book of Daniel. If you turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 6, this is a story we sometimes save for children in their Sabbath school programs, but it's really a very powerful theological message to adults. There was a professor that was giving an exam to his students in trigonometry. And he told the students before the test, he says, you're being tested on two things today. You're being tested on trigonometry and honesty. He said, I'm asking you, of course, to be honest and not cheat on your test. He said, if you're going to fail one of these tests, fail trigonometry. Do not fail honesty. He said, there are many good people out there that do not understand trigonometry, but there are no good people that do not understand honesty. Daniel was an honest man. And that's where our story takes up. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. It pleased King Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes to be over the whole kingdom and over these three governors of whom Daniel was first or chief, that the princes might give account to them and the king would suffer no damage or loss. 
Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. All right, you just need the background real quick to understand this story. The Babylonian kingdom had just been conquered by the Persians. When the Persians conquered the Babylonians, they killed all of um, the former king Belshazzar's uh, administrators, except one was spared, Daniel, who had actually served several Babylonian kings. The reason he was spared is everybody said, don't touch him. First of all, he foretold that you were going to come and destroy this nation. Secondly, he's an honest man. He didn't ask to be carried away captive from Judea. Uh, he just was forced into service, and uh, you can trust him. Well, the king heard so many good reports about Daniel, he said, we're going to spare your life, and we're going to put you in administration. But that really made the other leaders in Persia, the politicians are not all honest. You probably don't have that problem in Singapore. Sometimes politicians like to take a little money on the side for themselves. And uh, when Daniel was there, they couldn't cheat. He was so honest that on all the books, he paid everything. He, they offered him bribes for different kinds of laws. He said, no, I'm not taking any bribes, and I'm not letting you take any bribes. And they thought, we've got to get rid of this guy. And what made matters worse it says, the king thought to set him over the whole realm. They said, we don't want this former Jewish captive telling us what to do. So they were trying to find some way to get rid of Daniel. The Bible says that there was an excellent spirit in him. Now, how many of you would like to be spirit possessed? How come nobody raised their hands? Because <laughs> you automatically, when I say spirit possessed, what spirit do you think of? evil spirit we don't believe that God can possess us with a good spirit the Bible says an excellent spirit was in him he had the Holy Spirit and I would like to be filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit wouldn't you yes. Daniel was spirit filled by the way you know the Bible says unless you're born of the water and the spirit you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven you not only, if people think, oh, I just got to get baptized. It's more than that. You need to be born of the water and the spirit. It's not optional. We must be spirit-filled. Before the children of Israel entered the promised land, they went through the Red Sea. They were baptized, and they went through the cloud. They were baptized in the fire. And we need both baptisms. If you look in the Jewish sanctuary, on the way to the holy place, they went by the fire, and they went by the water. You've got the spirit baptism, you've got water baptism. Sometimes Seventh-day Adventists emphasize, well, they were baptized in the water, but we don't ever say, were they baptized in the spirit? Because you cannot live the Christian life without both baptisms. When Jesus came out of the water, the Holy Spirit came down on him. We need both baptisms. Amen. So Daniel was filled with the spirit. And the king is thinking about setting him over the whole realm, making him second in command. So the governors and the princes sought to find some occasion against Daniel, some charge concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. He was full of faith. If you want to be ready in the last days, you need to be spirit-filled and you need to be full of faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. If you have faith, you can say unto this mountain, be plucked up and cast in the depths of the sea, and whatever you ask will be done. And that verse is not talking about moving mountains of dirt. The Bible says our sins are like a mountain. He will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. We need the kind of faith the Bible speaks of in Hebrews 11, faith that brings down the walls of Jericho and faith that brings down giants and faith that will take a woman who is barren, 90 years of age, and give her a son. You know what I heard in the news yesterday? Did you read? 73 years old, a woman in India had twins. 
Her husband was 80. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? And so God wants us to have faith in the last days. They could find no fault with him. He was faithful. Everything he did, he was honest. They followed him around with spies. They put video cameras in his house. They bugged him. Well, yeah, I'm speaking meta, you know, in a metaphor. <laughs> they were tracking him around. You gotta be very careful what you do these days because someone's always got their camera on, right? And uh, I don't know if it's like this in Singapore, but uh, we were in Taiwan. They had cameras everywhere. We got to the bottom of the escalator. I saw seven cameras. And everything you do, you're being watched. Well, you know, God has cameras. Are you faithful? You know what a person of integrity is? A person of integrity is someone who is the same when they're alone as they are when people are watching. Daniel was faithful. They find, tried to find some fault, but they could not. Then these men said, we're not going to find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. We're going to have to get him on a religious law. So the governors and the princes thronged before the king. Now, I need to stop here and mention something. A lot of these Bible heroes are types of Christ. Joseph is a type of Christ. Moses is a type of Christ. Daniel is a type of Christ. David is a type of Christ. How is Daniel a type of Christ? Well, several things. First of all, he's faithful. The Bible says they had spies following him around and they found no fault in him. What did Pilate say about Jesus? I find no fault in him. Did Jesus have spies that followed him? That's what the Bible says, but they couldn't find anything that he was doing wrong. And then finally they said, we're going to have to get him on a religious law. He made himself God, they accused. So these governors and princes, I'm in Daniel 6.6. 6. So these governors and princes thronged before the king, and they said, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom and the administrators and the princes and the counselors and advisors, we've consulted together. They're lying. It wasn't all of them. It was a small group of jealous ones. To establish a royal decree, to make a royal statute, to establish a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, O king, will be cast into the den of lions. Now, that was the death penalty. Um, in Babylon, they might kill a person with a fiery furnace. But here in uh, Persia, they would throw you into a pit filled with furious, hungry, ferocious Asian lions. And they would tear you apart. The Bible says that uh, they persuaded the king. The king says, now why are we doing this? What, why are we making this law? They said, well, we've just conquered Babylon. We've got all 120 different provinces. These people come from different backgrounds and cultures and languages, but the way to unite them is common worship. Now, that's a very important point. In the last days, is the devil going to tr try to unite the world under one political system through common worship? Kingdoms will not cleave to each other, but he's going to make a law that whoever does not worship all over the world will not buy or sell ultimately will be killed if they do not worship the way they're told. Do we see in Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar made an image and whoever did not worship. Kings knew that sometimes the best way to unite people was through common worship. Treat the king like he's divine. Even the Caesars were declared gods. They knew they weren't gods. But they knew it would unite the people to adore them and to worship them. The pharaohs made themselves out to be gods. And so they said, Darius, it'll unite the kingdom. It's a smart move. You need to do this. And he was reluctant, but he said, well, if you're all saying this is a good idea, okay. So for 30 days, not forever, just 30 days, they've got to pray to you. And uh, anyone who does not obey that law, they're going to be killed. And so 
They said, now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing, notice this, so it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Notice, it does not change, does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. He made it official. No going back now. Now, here's one of the most important verses in the Bible. I don't know if you ever mark in your Bible, but if you want to know about a great verse in the Bible, it's Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now, let me tell you why. It's great to me. I hope it's great to you. If it's not, I hope it will be when I'm done. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, Daniel knows about this new law. What does the law say? If you're caught praying to any god or man for 30 days except King Darius, you'll be killed. Daniel knows. What does Daniel do? What would you do? Some people would say, well, just 30 days. I think I can put my light under a bush for 30 days. I won't pray to King Darius, but I will not pray to Jehovah publicly because I don't want to cause problems for everybody. I might lose my job. There's some people who will not keep the Sabbath because, oh, God understands, I might lose my job. So they work on Sabbath. But the Bible says the heroes in the Bible were willing to not only lose their jobs, they were willing to lose their lives rather than disobey. Oh, God will understand, I'm not going to break the Sabbath commandment just for this one exam. I've got to do this exam, and I'm sure he'll understand. And that's what the devil says, just 30 days. Just disobey a little bit. And once he gets you in the habit of disobeying a little bit, then pretty soon it gets easier. And you don't understand the nature of sin. God is wanting men and women who will stand up for him in the last days regardless of the consequences. When God says it, we're going to do it. Even if it means our lives are on the line. There's going to be another law in the future that tells us how to worship. So what does Daniel do? Daniel knows the writing is signed. He went home and in his upper room, it's in a place of visibility. And probably Daniel's got a nice home where he's got a an upper room that opens towards a courtyard with his window open towards Jerusalem. Why is Daniel praying towards Jerusalem? Because Daniel was a Bible reader and King Solomon said in the Bible, if your people are carried away to a foreign land because of their unfaithfulness and you pray towards this place, then hear thou in heaven and answer their prayer. Daniel did exactly what the word said. Why did he pray three times a day? Because Daniel read where King David wrote, morning, evening, and at noon will I pray in Psalm 55. Daniel read the Bible. If you look in Daniel chapter 9, it says, Daniel says, I was reading the prophecies of Jeremiah. So there's no question. Daniel was a Bible reader. And the other thing we see is Daniel was a prayer. When he knew the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open. Couldn't he have closed his windows? Just close your windows. Or if you're going to open your windows, the Bible says he kneeled down on his knees. Can't you just look like you're smelling the fresh air and listening to the birds? Do you have to get on your knees so everybody in the courtyard sees you're praying? They all know about the law. You see, I think uh, Daniel had been in Babylon a long time. He had a habit. You let me finish this whole verse. He went down on his knees, windows open toward Jerusalem, prayed, gave thanks before his God as his custom was since early days. What's a custom? Something you're in the practice of doing. That means, you know what a cuckoo clock is? Cuckoo clock, they may not have them in Singapore. They come from Switzerland. It's an old design clock that, you know, at 12 o'clock or different times you set it, that it looks like a little birdhouse. And, then at uh, 12 o'clock, all of a sudden, this little door opens up. The, the Swiss were very creative. They made this mechanism so that you would wind it up, and the door would open up, a little bird would come out, and go, cuckoo, 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 12 times, and then the doors would close, and it would come and go back in. And uh, Daniel was like a cuckoo clock. They could set their clock by Daniel because three times a day for years, morning, evening, and at noon, his window would open, he'd walk out where everyone could see him, he would get on his knees, he'd lift his hands, and he would pray to Jehovah towards Jerusalem, praying that God's people would be able to go back to the promised land. 
You want to know how to live in the last days? You need to read the Word of God. You need to have regular prayer. You need to be praying every day that you can get back to the promised land. How many of you want to go to the promised land? The thing on his heart was he wanted to be in the land of God with the people of God. And so he came out. You know, this would have been a good time for him to compromise. Just open your window. Don't kneel. Or kneel, but don't open your window. And if you're going to open your window and kneel, maybe they'll think you're praying to King Darius. Don't pray out loud to Jehovah so everybody knows. But instead, he's got his back to the palace of Darius and he's facing Jerusalem. Everything about what Daniel did was very boldly announcing, I don't care what the government law says. I'm going to put the law of God first because the Bible says it is more important to obey the law of God than man. So he prayed and he knelt. You know, the most important things for you to be ready in the last days are the three disciplines of the Christian life. Three things I'm going to really share with you. It's pretty simple. I don't know if you're acquainted with the Old Testament sanctuary and how it was laid out. It wasn't that complicated. There's just seven things. You walk in, you've got the fire, then you've got the labor, the water. Then you go into the holy place. There's three things in the holy place. Bread, light, and an altar of incense. Those are the three things that prepare you to enter into the presence of God. Now, what are those three things? What is the bread? I'll give you one guess. Man does not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Do you read the Bible on a regular basis every day. The Bible says, give us this day our daily bread. And when you pray that prayer, you're probably not thinking about, do I have food to eat? I hear Singapore is a fairly affluent country. So do you still pray the Lord's Prayer? And when you pray the Lord's Prayer, it's not just talking about, will I eat another meal? It's talking about, give us this day your daily bread. Because if you have to go without the bread of God or your physical bread, miss your physical bread and get the bread of God, this is the bread that will keep you from temptation during the day. And yet I'm amazed how many Christians I meet that scarcely ever open their Bibles. They think, well, I go to church once a week, that should be enough. Really? You're going to try to survive all week long on what you get from the pastor. Do you eat once a week? You probably eat two, three times a day. We need to regularly feed our souls and feast on God's word. Now, there's so much other media that people listen to. We've got time to watch dumb YouTubes. We've got time for television and DVDs. We've got time for silly magazines. We've got time to take in all kinds of information, but when it comes from the, the love letter from God to us, God speaking to our hearts, we say, I'm so busy. People do what they want to do. You have time for what you want. The Bible says those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. You need to make the word of God a priority if you want the experience and the faith of Daniel. The reason Daniel had so much courage and faith during this big time of test, he was faithful in the little tests of things in his daily devotions. He read his Bible. What else was in the sanctuary? There was a candlestick, and that represented witnessing. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Set your light on a hill. Let your good works so shine before men. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We need to be able to share our faith. Don't be afraid to tell people what you believe. Daniel was not afraid to get on his knees and open his windows and pray out loud where everybody saw what he believed. We were with our team, Karen and I and Jared, in uh, Taiwan, <laughs> and we wanted to immerse ourselves in the Taiwanese culture. So we found a Subway restaurant, and we got a sandwich. I'm telling a joke. 
Subway's a North American restaurant. And so while we were in there getting our, our veggie sandwiches, we prayed, we bowed our heads, and we prayed and asked God to bless our food. Well, there were some other young people sitting at a table across from us, and they struck up a conversation. They said, we couldn't help but notice that you prayed and asked God to bless your food. Are you Christians? And we began to talk, and they were Christians. And you'd be surprised how many opportunities we could have to witness to others if we would not put our light under a bush, but we would pray. Let people know what you believe. Open your window. Let your light shine. I said, there's three things. There was the bread, there was the light, and then there was the altar of incense. That represents prayer. So you've got reading your Bible, praying, and witnessing. Those are the three most important dis disciplines. If you want to grow as a Christian, read your Bible every day. This is how God talks to you. If you want to love God, you need to know him better. If you know him better, you'll serve him better, you'll obey him better, but it starts with you hear him when he speaks to you through his word, he hears you when you speak to him through prayer, and then as you speak to God and as he speaks to you, you're going to be so excited you'll speak to others. So it starts like this. The cross is this love relationship, love the Lord with all your heart, then love your neighbor as yourself. The Great Commission is go and tell the whole world. But the Great Commission doesn't happen until the Great Invitation, where he says, come to me. First, you've got the vertical relationship. You come to God, then you go for God. And this is a key to the Christian life. In your prayer and Bible study, you're coming to God, and then you're going for God. And this is what Daniel did. And everybody could tell that he had a relationship with the Lord. Now, when he knew the writing was signed, he went home in his upper room, place of visibility, with his windows open toward Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times that day, prayed and gave thanks. Would you give thanks if you were about to become cat food? Daniel is thanking God because the Bible says, in all things give thanks. He's thanking God as his custom was since early days. He thought, whatever happens to me, I'm going to praise the Lord. Well, the men were all waiting. Maybe they waited two or three days so they had evidence of him doing this. Then they assembled and found Daniel praying and su supplicating before his God, and he was arrested. What was Jesus doing in the garden before he was arrested? He's praying. I told you Daniel is a type of Jesus. And they go to the king and they say, King, haven't we written a law that says that if anyone makes any petition to any god or man for 30 days except thee, O king, he's going to the den of lions? The king says, yeah, of course, you, I just signed that, yeah. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not change? Yeah. Then they said, that Daniel, notice how they're saying it, had Daniel. From the captivity of Judah, he hadn't been in Judah in 70 years, and they still can't forget that. There's a little bit of discrimination there in the courts of Persia. He makes his petition to his God three times a day. And as soon as the king heard that, he said, oh, this was a trap. You guys tricked me. You were trying to get rid of Daniel because he's honest and you want to steal from the treasury. I didn't realize what you were up to. I forgot. He prays to his God every day. This was a trick. I said, don't forget. Law doesn't change. And the king, he got his lawyers. He said, is there anything, any loopholes, anything we can do to help save Daniel? The Bible says the king labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. There's nothing. They said, king, they came back. They said, you signed a law, Medes and the Persians, it does not change. Now notice this. Three times they say, this law does not change. It does not change. It does not change. I can think of three or four times in the Bible when kings wrote laws, they wanted to change, and they could not change their own law. King Ahasuerus wrote a law that all the Jews would be attacked on a certain day. And then his wife said, uh, darling, I'm a Jew. And he said, oh. He couldn't get rid of his law, so he gave her permission to make another law that the Jews could first attack their enemies. But he couldn't change his law. King Herod, he spoke and he made a promise. He said, if you come and dance for me, I'll give you anything you want, up to half the kingdom. She said, okay, I want the head of John the Baptist. He said, oh. He spoke and he couldn't change his law. John the Baptist died. 
And here, King uh, Darius, he signs this law, and now his friend is going to die, and he says, I can't change my own law, because a king's law cannot be changed. How in the world can people and Christians think that the king of the universe is going to write a law with his own finger and speak it with his own voice, and he's going to whimsically say, I think I'll change that one, I'll keep that one, I'll change that one. The law of God does not change. Sin is the transgression of the law. The problem is not the law, the problem is our sin. He saves us and he changes us. He doesn't change the law. And he hasn't changed the Sabbath. The king labored till the going down of the sun, and there was nothing he could do. So he came to Daniel. <clears throat> and he said, uh, he brought him and he commanded they should cast him into the den of lions. Verse 16. And the king spoke to Daniel, saying, Your God, who you serve continually, he will deliver you. How do you survive in the last days? You can underline that verse. Your God that you serve from time to time. Is that what it said? Were you listening? Your God who you serve when the mood is good. When you don't have low blood sugar, you're not tired. Your God that you serve when everyone's nice to you. It says, your God that you serve continually, he will deliver you. If you are consistently serving God, you have nothing to fear about the last days. And so the king, he commanded, a stone was brought. He put Daniel in the lion's den. A stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the signet of his lord's. Now notice this. Was Jesus innocent? Was Jesus placed in a tomb? Was there a government seal placed on the stone door? Yes. Did Jesus come out alive? Does Daniel come out alive? The Bible says the king labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. What time of day did Jesus die? About sundown. And notice what it says, the king then passed the night in fasting, nor were instruments of music brought before him. When God the Father was in heaven and Jesus was in the tomb, were angels playing their harps? There was silence. Their commander, their champion was in the grave. There was no angelic music. And it tells us, then the king arose. I'm in verse 19, Daniel 6. The king arose early in the morning, and he went in haste to the den of lions. What time of day did the women come to the tomb? Very early in the morning, right? You, see, you understanding what I'm saying? By the way, was Jesus married? Was Daniel married? No, of course, Daniel was a eunuch. And Jesus never married either, because Daniel was married to God's people, and Jesus was married to the church. King comes to the den. He says, I've kept the law. He went to the lion's den. Now take away the stone. And the king spoke to Daniel. He calls into the darkness of the den. He said, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God who you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Now here, here the king, they were telling everybody the king was a god. And the king, who's supposed to be God, he said, Daniel, you're the one who serves the real God. I'm not a god. Servant of the living God, did your God save you from the lions? You notice when he put Daniel in the lions, then he said, your God will deliver you. But now, he says, has your God delivered you? Not so sure. And a voice comes up out of the lions then. O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was innocent before him. Also, O king, I've done no wrong before you. Now, who is the lion? The devil goes around as a roaring lion seeking whom he could devour. Can the devil keep you in the grave? Could the devil keep Jesus in the grave? If you are in Christ, the devil can't keep you there. The lions could not touch Daniel. Someone said the lions could not eat Daniel because he had too much backbone. <laughs> he was too strong. I can just picture, I, I remember hearing Dwight Moody talk about, I didn't hear it because he was dead, but I read it. Um, Daniel was in the lion's den and, 
And so he, well, he's, you know, Daniel's 80 years old. They dropped him down in the lion's den and it's probably not real comfortable in there and he hears all the growling and the glaring and he thinks, you know, I need to get some rest. And so he finds a lion and he goes, leans up against the lion and elbows it and says, vibrate. And so the elbow starts to purr and purred him to sleep. He had nothing to fear. You think this is just a story? It says here, they, the king gave the command. He was exceedingly glad, and he commanded they should take Daniel up out of the lion's den. Oh, by the way, I don't want to miss this verse. It says here, my God has sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, so they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him. And also before thee, O king, I've done no wrong. Was Daniel innocent? The Bible says king, uh, that Pilate found no fault in him. He said, I find this man innocent. The king was exceedingly glad. He commanded they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury was found on him because he believed in his God. So Daniel believed in God and he was innocent. What does it mean to believe in God? How did Daniel show his belief? He got on his knees three times a day. He read his Bible. This is how we show that we are believing in God. Now, some of you might think this is a nice story for children in the Bible, but it's actually, I believe, a true story. Jesus refers to Daniel as though it is a true story. I remember reading a newspaper report from Abba Davis, Ethiopia, 2005. A young girl had been kidnapped, 13 years old, from her family, Christian. Some Islamic men were going to force her into a wedding. And she would not cooperate, and they beat her. And her family came looking for her. She had escaped. And the men chased after her, and she ran into a pack of three lionesses. And the three lionesses went after the men chasing her, and they ran off. And when the family came to rescue her, they saw that she was sitting in the midst of three lionesses. The lions were laying all about her, and they did nothing to harm her. When the family came, the lions saw them. They got up, and they walked away. God sent his lions <laughs> to protect. Now, some people say, well, Pastor Doug, this was no miracle. The reason the lions did not eat Daniel is because they had just eaten so many Babylonian politicians. You know, when the, the uh, Persians killed the Babylonians, when they conquered, then they threw all these Babylonian politicians into the lion's den, and the lions had eaten so many. And politicians will make you sick anyway. And so they, then when they threw Daniel in there, they just kind of burped and rolled over and said, oh, I can't eat anymore. They're, they say the lions weren't hungry. I remember hearing a story about a, uh, a young hippie. He had problems with drugs and drinking, but he went to a Christian mission in New York City where he found Jesus. They preached to him, and he found Jesus. He accepted the Lord, and his life was changed, and they gave him a Bible, and he started reading his Bible, but he didn't know a lot about the Bible. And so he was out sitting by a park bench in um, Central Park, and he was reading his Bible, and he's... So he couldn't contain himself. He was so excited. He said, oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He said it out loud. Well, a lawyer who was an atheist was walking by, and he heard the young man. He said, well, why are you making these religious expressions? He said, oh, mister, I'm reading the Bible. First time. He said, it's the most wonderful book. It's full of miracles. He said, I just read where God uh, parted the Red Sea for the children of Israel to go across. And the lawyer said, uh, actually, that wasn't the Red Sea. That was called the Sea of Reeds, and it was only six inches deep. It wasn't a miracle. Well, the man looked educated, and the young hippie, he didn't know. He said, oh, I, thanks, I didn't know that. Thank you very much. So the atheist felt very proud of himself. He started to walk away, and then he heard the young man go, hallelujah, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus. And he turned around, he came back. He said, why are you shouting now? He said, mister, it's wonderful. God just drowned the whole Egyptian army in six inches of water. <laughs> So if you don't think the lions were hungry, it says here, the king gave the command, and they took all those men and brought them, this is verse 24, who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions. 
them and their children, their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever even hit the bottom of the den. And then because of Daniel's faithfulness, the Bible says the king then issues a decree to the entire world that he ruled, to all peoples, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. His dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered and he reigned. He prospered during the reign of Darius and into the reign of Cyrus. Daniel lived probably about 100 years. How do you survive in the last days? Three things. Read your Bible every day. Pray every day. And then pray that God gives you opportunity to let your light shine and witness. As you do those things, your faith will grow. Your consistency in following him will grow. You'll make room for the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. And you can look forward to the coming of the Lord with confidence. How many of you want to have that experience? We're going to be faced with a test in the last days about the law of God. People are going to tell us how we ought to worship. If we're not being faithful in the little things now, then we will not be faithful in the big test when it comes. I want to be faithful, don't you? Can I pray for you before we close? Father, as we bring this part of our service to a conclusion, we just want to send up a prayer, a special appeal, that all of us might have the faith of Daniel, that we all might recognize the importance of seeking first your kingdom, of having a relationship with you through prayer, the study of your word, and then sharing our faith with others. Bless these dear people in this great country, Lord. Help them to be faithful. I pray that we will make it our minds up that it's more important to obey you than man, that uh, we will fill our minds with the truth of your word and be sanctified by it. And we'll spend time praying, not only on our knees at regular intervals, but to even pray without ceasing, to walk with you, Lord. Bless this church, the pastors, and each member, all the families. We thank you and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.